let me say how, uh, how pleased I am to see such a, a good audience at this, uh, uh, at this center event. These have all been fantastic, and uh, this one from our first speaker is, um, uh, is shaping up to be the same. Um, I'm a neurologist and uh, a neuroscientist, and I want to share uh, a little bit of my amateur enthusiasm for Shakespeare, but also reflect somewhat um, from the standpoint of a neuroscientist on, what, uh, on the kinds of questions that he's asking and the way in which we are now asking them anew in slightly different ways. So um, let's talk a bit about understanding the mind through the art of Shakespeare and the science of brain imaging. Now the basic argument that I want to frame in the talk today is, um, is not that Shakespeare was a scientist. I don't believe that at all. Um, scientists are actually very modern inventions. Um, I don't even think a scientist would have been recognized in Shakespeare's time uh, as a professional of any particular type. But Shakespeare's theatre, uh, where he worked as an actor, as a playwright, producer, I think was very, was the result of very iterative experiments and observations uh, in, that worked in ways that invite comparisons with the scientific method. It was a highly competitive environment, as I'll describe in, uh, over the course of the talk. And Shakespeare's plays, which were not codified in the way that we think of plays now, set down in a text from the very beginning that was rigidly followed by the actors word for word thereafter, uh, were, must have been highly fluid presentations that were adapted to the audience in order to pull the punters in. There's a lot that he learned about the psychology of his fellow man from that. But Shakespeare also, just as Tom was telling us, was a sponge for the information around him. And he reflects many of the ideas current at the time. He repeatedly demonstrates, for example, his awareness of the emerging modern medicine of his time. It is an extraordinary statistic to appreciate that Shakespeare uh, mentions psychiatric or neurological disease directly or indirectly uh, more than 700 times across his many plays. But perhaps most important, and what I'll spend the greatest time on today, is uh, discussing a little bit about the psychological paradigms that Shakespeare employed as a dramatist and explaining some of their current brain cor bra um, what we currently understand as their brain correlates that provide a little bit of insight into the mechanisms that are responsible for our enjoyment of Shakespeare. Well, I want to go back to something that Tom began with, but just reflect it um, uh, in a slightly uh, 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 broaden the, the observation out. The Elizabethan age was an extraordinary period uh, that it was the mark the beginning, or slightly before the Elizabethan age with her father Henry VIII, really the beginning of the modern age. Uh, Europe was moving out of the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and we see Elizabeth as a strong figure straddling the two um, uh, the two modes of thinking and culture, and Shakespeare as one of the most, uh, one of a premier evocation of them. Ideas uh, were exciting. The world was expanding at a rate that is very hard for us to appreciate even today. When ships were moving out and the world was exploding in size, um, the hot science of the time was related to how to find where you were in the world, how to navigate, how to explain the very vastness of, of what was being uncovered. Now Shakespeare was born into this and again, as Tom emphasized, what we, when any of us speak about Shakespeare, we're speaking through the words that have come down to us filtered by uh, the folios in his plays. He was a very he's a very elusive figure to go back and try to understand. This is of course uh, a very famous uh, portrait of Shakespeare, uh, which all of us know from the textbooks, a painting, uh, probably almost certainly wasn't Shakespeare, uh, but it's an awfully good likeness of a kind of 
Uh, I always think of this as the pirate Shakespeare. This is the iconoclast, you know, the little ring in his ear, uh, the youthful uh, and confident look. But of course, this is the folio Shakespeare, and um, this looks a little bit more, uh, this is the cerebral Shakespeare. This is Shakespeare the thinker, and this is, I think, you know, the Shakespeare that Ben Jonson and his colleagues who wanted to uh, acknowledge his greatness uh, uh, post-mortem uh, after his death um, uh, really wanted us to remember, that very high forehead. Um, but in fact, uh, while I think he may have had a high forehead, this, I wonder, might be the, the most veridical Shakespeare because this was, uh, this was put up by his uh, daughter and son-in-law after his death uh, in the church um, in Stratford-on-Avon. So this may be the closest uh, to uh, the real figure of the man. And this um, looks like a pretty upright citizen, Shakespeare the burger, uh, the man who always wanted to make good. And you know, he was not a pirate at all in my mind, although he was intellectually courageous. You know, his entire life, uh, he wanted to make sure that the family had a, a coat of arms, uh, that his father's name was vindicated, and that he could go back to Stratford to show uh, that he was a rich and successful merchant. Now, Shakespeare's London was an incredibly rich, chaotic, stinking, noisy place. Um, this is uh, where Shakespeare lived um, uh, later in his time in London, um, uh, but he, he moved around. And, and what's important, I think, for this story is that when Shakespeare first came to London and lived in the Bishopsgate area, um, uh, this was very near where, the, uh, where Bedlam had been. Uh, and Bedlam, of course, now has moved down to, uh, it's about an hour's walk uh, from the Globe, south of the river. Uh, but Bedlam, um, uh, which uh, already by Shakespeare's time had a rich history, uh, it was founded um, more than 300 years earlier in the mid 13th century um, as um, a, a hospice associated with the church. And, uh, and more recently uh, to Shakespeare, this became uh, associated uh, very much with uh, placement of uh, the chronically ill and most of these uh, were believed to be insane. And one of the, uh, you know, we think now about um, uh, hospitals for the mentally ill as places where you hide people. In those days, uh, this was actually a form of uh, street theater. It's hard to imagine uh, the, uh, uh, the sort of callousness that was associated with this. But what you actually see here is, um, if you look at this picture carefully, not only do you see the, um, uh, the people um, uh, who uh, are the, the inmates, uh, the sufferers, but you see walking through in the back uh, two ladies of fashion um, uh, uh, warding off uh, the smell of what must have been an awful place, um, but um, they pay, they, uh, people could pay for admission and walk through here uh, to see uh, people uh, in um, their contortions uh, and hear their mad ravings. And this was something that um, it's hard to believe that Shakespeare, uh, with his interest in people, didn't do. Um, he certainly must have been aware of it. And the references to, um, uh, the references, as I said, to uh, neurological or psychiatric disease abound. And I'll just mention a, a few of them, probably known to, to most of you. Um, Julius Caesar, uh, of course, is, uh, has the falling sickness. And there's a famous line, uh, uh, Caesar is off stage, uh, but um, uh, uh, question is, you know, what's detaining Caesar? And um, uh, his swoon is described. Now, it's actually meant in a, in a rather different way because epilepsy in Shakespeare's age uh, was viewed with such awe that it was, it was like being touched by God uh, to be struck dumb uh, and um, uh, uh, to have a private uh, com commune with something outside the body. In, um, uh, there's Henry VI down there in a, a much later edition, uh, but Henry VI came, contains one of the first English literary references to uh, the palsy uh, when um, uh, 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 a description of Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, the man was not quaking with fear, uh, but with the palsy. And of course, uh, one of the most uh, powerful evocations of a psychotic depression uh, 
uh, in literature must be Lady Macbeth um, uh, as she uh, uh, privately um, uh, uh, goes into uh, her world of depression uh, and ultimately suicide. Uh, Othello is not uh, often thought of as a great medical treatise, uh, but um, in fact it, um, it abounds with tale with concerns about uh, poisonings, uh, possession, uh, and various types of mental illness, one of the most notable being, of course, that of Othello himself. Um, uh, there is something uh, rare, uh, delusional uh, jealousy uh, now is recognized and goes by the term Othello syndrome. Uh, and of course, therein lies the origin. And we all know about uh, one of the first demonstrations uh, um, um, of the power uh, for the public of um, uh, the, the opiate anesthetics um, uh, in, uh, on which the plot turns in Romeo and Juliet, where Juliet uh, is given a powerful uh, uh, intoxicant by the friar, uh, falls in uh, to a deep sleep, and just as opiates uh, uh, suppress um, uh, the respiratory activity, uh, Juliet must have been when Romeo came into the tomb uh, so still and so quiet that she appeared inert and lifeless. Now, another a key aspect of the theater that I referred to at the beginning is um, uh, that it was, uh, the theater was a much more dynamic uh, organization than we usually associate uh, with theater now. Um, theaters used to pop up in um, uh, pubs and inns uh, around London. It was a hugely competitive environment. Um, and uh, Shakespeare, um, of course, was out to make, uh, uh, to, you know, to make enough money to go back to Stratford and be successful. So he was, um, he was uh, trying to be as innovative uh, as possible and used a whole range of literary uh, playwrights tricks uh, to really make his plays have that zing, the equivalent, I think, of today's special effects uh, on the big screen. Now, I'm going to describe uh, 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 some of the neuroscience behind uh, just three of these. Um, uh, the first is um, auditory and visual imagery, which of course is hugely rich. No, if almost no stage directions in Shakespeare. The stage directions come entirely out of the language. And in fact, you don't need a stage for Shakespeare. And that's very, you know, I think that's, a, uh, that's intended. You can't do theater in a pop-up location if you need all sorts of uh, scenery around you. And of course, one of the greatest ones we'll hear in just a moment uh, from the chorus of Henry V. Now, amongst literary devices, uh, there are many, but I want to describe one particularly interesting one uh, called the functional shift, where one takes a word and uses it in um, a, a, a grammatically atypical way. So, for example, oh, tis the spite of hell to lip a wanton in a secure couch and to suppose her chaste. A uh, very striking phrase. Uh, functional, uh, coming from this functional shift. And of course, uh, throughout Shakespeare, uh, most of which is poetry uh, in the plays, uh, the prosody uh, uh, of the poetry comes through. And of course, most, we believe much of this was often coupled uh, with music. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the language and the, the functional shift. Uh, now again, uh, this manipulation of language uh, really is what you need to, is, is an incredibly powerful tool to turn uh, a sentence into something that, that really uh, carries resonance. So for example, we could say he was no longer alone in the world, he was married to a kind and beautiful woman. That's a nice thought, but not one that particularly strikes you. Uh, but we could also say he was no longer a, alone in the world, he was wived to a kind and beautiful woman. Now, reading, these are modern uh, functional shifts. Reading Shakespeare, there are many peculiarities of the language that make it actually quite difficult to, to, to hear for a modern audience in, in a proper way. So um, uh, a group 
uh, from uh, uh, from uh, 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 from Liverpool and um, and um, uh, uh, Swansea uh, did a very interesting brain imaging study. I'll show you in a moment, in which they wanted to study this phenomena, but they rather than drawing from Shakespeare directly, they translated uh, the paradigms into modern language, as you've seen here. And then they simply asked the question, what is the difference between the way the brain, uh, uh, the activity in the brain is distributed and the amount of activity there is, um, between when you are hearing uh, uh, the same idea expressed in a direct, uh, grammatically usual way, and in the context of a functional shift. And what the, when they did this experiment, in which they played about 60 different sentences to people, randomly uh, varying the sentences between structures of our grammatically uh, usual language and those of functional shift, they identified a number of uh, brain regions, shown here uh, in a cutaway cartoon brain um, uh, as, as red, uh, that showed markedly increased activity in the brain uh, with the functional shift sentences relative uh, to their normal language equivalents. What's important is they saw no areas that showed decreased activity, so the brain simply becomes more active. But moreover, it becomes more active in some very interesting areas. Um, now the first that I want to point out is that area called ACC, or the anterior cingulate uh, cortex is an area in the front uh, that is, is our alerting center in the brain. Lots of activities, uh, regardless of their class, that force us to focus attention, to select between stimuli, to analyze, uh, begin to activate uh, this area. Uh, the, if we look down uh, towards um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the right-hand image, you see something labeled IFG. Now that's on the right side of the brain. Most language areas, as you see on the far left, um, are in the left side of the brain. So when people have a left-sided stroke, uh, they become aphasic. Most of us, if we have a right-sided stroke, may become paretic on the left side of our body, but our language is intact. And that's because most normal language is confined to the left hemisphere. Very special things start to be processed over in the right hemisphere. And those are found with poetry and music because of prosody, uh, but also very atypical language forms. Uh, for example, processing of foreign languages, things that demand um, uh, syntactic analysis uh, tend to engage uh, the right hemisphere. So together with this picture uh, with increased activation in uh, alerting centers of the brain, greater activation in the left hemisphere, which we associate with language, and this recruitment of this special right hemispheric reason, region is consistent with the notion that the functional shift takes the same idea but forces um, an, al an alertness, an awakening of the brain, and increased semantic uh, and uh, uh, syntactic analyses. Okay. Now I'm going to try, this is my experiment uh, today to try to pull in the punters. Let's see if it, it works. We, we are missing our lectern uh, because of a dinner and none of us can find it. So I have some, uh, something, uh, some clips to play and I'm going to try to move my microphone next to my own computer uh, to see if I can uh, ensure that you hear these. Well, I must say, that gives me shivers every time I hear it. But what you are listening to there is, I think, the expression of what the theater is. It's asking us to use words to imagine sounds, an environment, a space, uh, to not suspend disbelief, but to actually allow our brains to encapsulate a long period of time in the hour and a half of the play. Now, modern neuroscience has really taken on the problem of what imagery is in a very big way because it poses a real conundrum. Is the imagery that Shakespeare is using so powerfully there something that sits 
as a separate space in our brain? Is it really, you know, do we, by imagining something, are we creating a little film that runs across some space in our consciousness? Or, more exciting, and I think more attuned with what the playwright is trying to do, are we in fact experiencing something akin to the events uh, that the words are evoking? And what I'm going to show you to summarize this story is something very exciting. The imagery that Shakespeare is evoking is actually making our brains work as if we were perceiving and beginning to act precisely as the actions demand. And let me show you what I mean. This is, uh, I'm going to show you just two examples from many experiments. This is um, an experiment in which a person was put into a positron emission tomography scanner, which is another kind of brain imaging scanner that measures blood flow. And um, don't laugh, they were asked to uh, imagine uh, the first three notes of three blind mice. Uh, and to actually ask whether they were, it was an ascending or a descending uh, tonal structure uh, along with some other uh, factors. And then they, alternatively, they were played uh, the same uh, three notes. Now if you look on the, uh, on the right, uh, you see the brain activation measured with PET uh, for playing the sound of the three notes in three blind mice. And what you see there um, in the bright colors is a very particular region of brain on the side, uh, just more or less behind the ears. It's the auditory cortex, the part of the brain that decodes sound in the world uh, and uh, sorts it out into tone uh, 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 and intensity. Now what you're looking at on the left is really remarkable. There is no sound. The scanner is silent. The room is quiet. There is no music, but people are imagining the first three notes that they are hearing, in fact, on the right. And what you can immediately see, and you don't need to be a neuroscientist to do this, is that the same brain areas are activated. In other words, for, or at least nearly the same. There's a, there's a tiny difference, but I won't trouble you with that. Um, the brain is calling on the primary sensory cortices in order to create uh, the imaginary space of audition. Now something that was, that's even more special to me, um, I think, more, and, and goes back to Jacobi's uh, prologue where, you know, you almost feel, I almost feel that I'm on the horses, you know, racing, uh, racing down to the, uh, the boats to go to France. But here you have um, an, an example of imagery of action. And the question is when we imagine an action, again, are we looking at a, uh, some sort of film running in our mind, or are we actually doing it? And they, they designed a, a really clever experiment. You see, they, they showed pictures of this moving um, uh, bit of blocks, and the moving bit of blocks um, moved around like this. Now, there, were two, there are two ways of making those blocks move. One is you take your hand and you actually physically twist it, and the other is there's a motor down at the bottom and it twirls them around. Now, what they did is they showed people a pictures, pictures um, uh, of, um, of uh, people twirling the blocks with their hand, or they showed them pictures in a different part of the experiment of the machine twirling the blocks. Then they asked people, um, after both of those different kinds of preparatory stimuli to lie in the functional imaging magnet, this is a, an fMRI experiment, and to imagine that block twirling around. Now, when they looked at the difference between what the people who had been looking at the hand moving it what, versus what the people looking at the machine moving it was, they found this bright red spot uh, is where the brain became more active where the hand was moving, the people saw the hand moving it around. Now why is that important? Because that's sitting squarely in the hand area of the primary motor cortex. That's exactly where the activation would come if they themselves were physically doing it at that moment. I think that's an extraordinary observation.
Now, the next thing I want to, I, what I want to, I'm going to move a little bit faster now. I'm afraid I'm just getting carried away with my enthusiasm here. But, but I, I, would, I just, you know, I've talked about how these pop-ups were happening all over London. There were a lot of companies. Innovation was, um, was, was there was a, a rampant cry for innovation in, um, in Shakespeare's um, uh, theater area. And one of, uh, just to give you an idea of how extreme this went, um, uh, the, uh, the boys' schools got into this. And so, um, uh, for those of you who think uh, uh, St. Paul's school is a little bit too snooty these days, remember that all of those kids were being flogged off as child actors in Shakespeare's time because it, it really, uh, that sold to the rich uh, really quite well. Well, he was having to compete with that uh, as well. And how do, you, how do you counter that kind of uh, competition? Let's see if I can make this one go. So I'm just going to go on, but this, um, uh, this recalls, of course, Orsino um, and uh, If Music Be the Food of Love. Now, uh, what Shakespeare knew in his poetry and what he used in the theater was the way in which music and prosody reaches directly to the emotions, even bypassing uh, concepts as words. And their uh, music has been more difficult to study uh, with uh, modern uh, cognitive neuroscience techniques, uh, but there has, uh, uh, there's been an, uh, a con there are some cons there's a considerable literature that is nonetheless developing. And this shows um, uh, some lovely work from the Davis lab of um, a, a scientist named Janata, in which he demonstrates very clearly the first thing about music is I told you before what a simple, simple tune that really wasn't quite music did to the brain. But if you look at a full-blown piece of music, and on the left we have um, uh, a, 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 a Schumann uh, a quartet, and on the right um, we have um, some uh, polyphonic singing. Um, they both show something uh, very important. First, when, you, when people listen to it relative to silence, um, their brains become active in the auditory area. If you look where the uh, arrow is in the upper part on the left, the primary auditory cortex, um, this is a brain, a bread loaf sliced brain, looking at that same area we saw on the PET scan before. Of course, the auditory cortex becomes important as the sound comes in and, and is decoded. But there are lots of other areas of brain that become uh, active as well. And look at those areas in red. Uh, uh, I've highlighted a couple of big areas down on the bottom. Uh, the, in the center, uh, there's that anterior cingulate area again, uh, that attentional center for the brain. Uh, we attend to music um, uh, quite uh, markedly. Uh, and then over uh, on the left and right, those areas of brain are those that are associated with expectancy. Uh, what we're doing when we're listening to music is because we know music, at least Western music, has a kind of structure. We're listening, we're hearing, uh, we're alert, but we're also anticipating what the next note is. And I'll tell you an interesting story, just anecdotally, one of the most unusual patients uh, I've seen recently um, was a, a very fine musician, an exceptional musician, uh, who suddenly developed um, uh, an inability to listen to music that he loved because it sounded dissonant. It, it sounded horrible. He said it was hard to describe how painful it was to listen to this music. Um, if he listened to music, and, and what was happening, um, uh, we discovered, because he found that if he listened to music he had no knowledge of before, he could listen to it and it sounded like music. It was anything that he knew was horrid, absolutely horrible. And it turned out what, what was actually happening is when he was listening to music, like most of us, if we know it, we are hearing the next note almost before it happens. And so he had a lesion in the brain that was disconnecting some of these expectancy-associated brain regions. And so, in consequence, there was it, um, uh, something like a delay between his expectation and the sound hitting it, which meant that it was clashing. Almost the adjacent uh, tones uh, were finding their way to the brain together. And that 
that horrible feeling that he was getting arose because music is so emotionally uh, uh, valent uh, to us. And what this illustrates, this is a map, this is a summary of lots of imaging studies of music and the big, <coughs> big areas uh, represent different parts of the brain. And what this shows is that these areas down in blue uh, in the temporal cortex are involving uh, the amygdala, which is an emotional center of the brain labeled with AM, uh, the temporal poles, temp P. These are areas of the brain that we associate with emotion, and they're coming, they're being directly activated by the music. Well, I hope I've highlighted that uh, as uh, following on from Tom, that Shakespeare was an incredibly innovative person. He was a thinker. He was listening to the ideas of the time. Um, and they have great considerable echoes for science today as we try to understand how we work as people. Uh, now, scientists uh, would not be recognized in Shakespeare's day, but uh, a man he would certainly have known about, uh, been curious about, I'm sure, is the famous uh, Dr. John Dee, uh, the court astrologer to Elizabeth, uh, a man who was actually sort of the Einstein of his day. He was a, an incredible whiz mathematician down from Cambridge. Um, and uh, in fact, such a good mathematician that he was thrown in prison for a short time being accused of witchery uh, because um, uh, of um, his mathematical prowess. But I think that Shakespeare viewed himself as a sort of magician, uh, that he, uh, in harnessing all of these psychological tricks, I think there was a certain um, hubris about this man as he realized that he could pull the audience in, uh, manipulate them. Uh, but um, as, he, um, as he grew older uh, and moved towards his retirement, life expectancies were not so long in those days. Um, uh, Shakespeare undoubtedly had his hubris uh, tempered uh, by, uh, by his own wisdom. And um, I think uh, just to close, I wanted to, to leave you with, uh, again, one of my favorite passages in all of Shakespeare, one of those that never ceases uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 excite me, uh, this, uh, the closing speech from The Tempest. There we are. I think that, that nicely sums up where Tom started us uh, you know, a little over an hour ago. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for your attention.